Hello and welcome to this edition of the Alaska Report. I've got some special guests with me today uh, on our last Alaska Report. I was able to introduce you to some, some great young Alaskans who were part of my summer internship program. They were with me for the month of June. Well now, today, I'm very, very fortunate to have our second session interns. These are young people from around the state who have just graduated from, from high school, and they have been with me for a month exploring the United States Senate, learning about our process, shadowing me, working on research projects, being an invaluable help to, to my office, and truly being ambassadors for all of Alaska. So I, I thank them for that. Uh, I was very fortunate as a young uh, woman to have been able to participate in Senator Ted Stevens' internship program uh, just after I had graduated from high school in Fairbanks. And so being able to continue that program many, many years after is, has always been a very special part of what I'm able to do. So today, as in keeping with, with Alaska reports in years prior where we have the interns, it is their opportunity to ask me questions. I've been asking them questions all throughout the past month, so now it's their turn to ask me questions either about policy issues that we're working on or perhaps other things that inquiring minds want to know. So welcome to the Alaska Report to each of you. Thank you for uh, all that you have done to help us. And we're going to start the, the program off with Malia. If you want to introduce yourself, give us your name, where you're from, and then proceed with your questions. Okay. Hello, my name is Malia Walters, and I recently graduated from Tri-Valley High School in Healy, Alaska. Before we begin, Senator, I would like to say thank you on behalf of all of the interns. As we've come to see, you're a very busy woman, but over the last four weeks, you've made time to welcome us into your office, and for that, we're grateful. Again, thank you. Well, thank you. Very kind. Now for my question. How are you working to help Native students become more exposed to their culture, such as through traditional dance classes or language classes? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question, Malaya, and I, I thank you for bringing it up because I feel very strongly that when, when, when young people are connected to their education, through their culture, through their heritage, it makes them want to learn more. It makes them just do better and, and, and just be better. Uh, unfortunately, our education systems oftentimes aren't uh, there to help us make those connections with the culture. I'm a very strong believer in encouraging um, our native languages. We know that unfortunately, instead of seeing more and more speaking in their native language, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing some of that die out. So those programs that will allow for uh, either immersion um, of our native cultural languages within the schools, uh, I think are important to, uh, to continue and encourage. We have, just with passage of the Every Child uh, Succeeds Act that we moved through the HELP Committee, which I'm on, and uh, through the Senate floor, we included uh, an amendment that I had helped shepherd that would uh, provide for a focus on our native cultural uh, languages, uh, working through our schools and encouraging uh, such immersion type programs. In addition, I've been uh, working to um, make sure that there are, are programs and um, a focus on, on our native languages, the Esther, Esther Martinez um, uh, Heritage Languages Act that uh, passed through the Congress several years ago is something that I was very proud to support. So making sure that we have these connections uh, between our native peoples and, and their culture through their language to me is, is critically important and something that I'm proud to be able to support. Thank you. Thank you. Moving to Taylor. Hi, Senator. Uh, my name is Taylor Sheldon, and I graduated from Grace Christian School. And my question is, how will you be able to convince the Army to keep the 2,600 troops at Jay Bear? Well, as you know, coming from, from Anchorage, um, the announcement that the Army would reduce the, 
uh, the forces there at, at J. Bear by 2600 was pretty devastating news. And understanding who these men and women are, this is, this is an airborne uh, brigade combat team, the only one that has expertise in an Arctic environment. Um, for us and our preparedness uh, for, for not only activity in the Arctic, but really the focus that, uh, that the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, that this administration has placed, this pivot to the Pacific, as we're going to, to, to try to be better prepared um, in this region for all contingencies, we need to make sure the assets are there. So when you take away a full brigade combat team or close to it, it, it leaves a hole there. So your question is a good one. What can be done? Uh, this is something that the Alaska delegation is absolutely united and lockstep on to, to make sure that not only um, the, the, those of us in Alaska know and understand the strategic importance of this, of this not only the brigade combat team, but all of our, of our military assets in Alaska as this strategic location, but, but also that those back in Washington, D.C. understand how critical it is and how short-sighted it is to, to make this move at this point in time. So budgets are issues, but when we're talking about our national security, we don't want to make a budget decision that is going to compromise our security position. And given the activity going on around the globe right now, given the concern that we have heard from some of, of those at the highest level of, of the command chain who say that the number one threat that they fear is coming from Russia, we got to make sure that everyone understands what, what uh, reduction of this force at J-Bear will mean. So we are not giving up on it. We're working aggressively. Very important to Alaska and to the nation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Caitlin. Senator. My name is Caitlin Bowers, and I recently graduated from Polaris in Anchorage, Alaska. My question for you today is, aside from politics, what career would you decide to pursue and why? Well, that's an easy one because for me, I always knew that I was going to be a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher, and so from the from my various very earliest years, I knew that I was going to be a teacher or a librarian. And I I wanted to be a librarian so that I could clock the cards out of the little checkout thing. They don't do that anymore. Um, but I but I had always thought um, until my about my junior year in college that I was going to be a teacher and I had focused in that direction. Um, to this day, I feel that in many, many ways, I have fulfilled that part of my, my career direction. Uh, there's not a day go, that goes by where I don't feel like I'm educating someone about Alaska, about energy issues, um, about the things that are important uh, to us as a state. And so, it, well, I've, I don't call myself a teacher by way of formal education. I feel like I am involved very much in, in continuing as an educator uh, in these areas that, that I love, whether it's Alaska or, or the subject matters that are important to Alaska families. So. I keep thinking that maybe one of these days when I retire, I could get into the classroom. I'd like to be a middle school teacher. That would be fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Max, it's up to you. OK. Hi, Senator. Hi. Uh, my name is Max Bluest. I'm from Juneau, Alaska, and I recently graduated from Juneau Douglas High School. And my question for you is, what are you doing to combat genetically modified salmon to protect our state's ecosystems and our fishing industry's place in the global market? Well, I start by not giving these genetically engineered fish such a respectful title. We call it Frankenfish. <laughs> it, is, it is well known that our wild, healthy, sustainable 
fisheries are, are the model where the envy uh, uh, truly of the, of the fisheries. And we've worked hard in Alaska to make sure that the reputation as, as a fabulous source of, of protein and omega-3 is, is heard around the world. When you take a genetically engineered fish, and it really causes you to even question, should we call it a fish? This is a cross between an eel, the genes between an eel pout and a chinook uh, that is engineered so that it grows twice as fast as, as a regular um, uh, a wild uh, fish. Um, it has been going through a process for approval through FDA through for a period of years. And the concern that I have is that we, we still don't know for certain about the, the safety of, of this so-called frankenfish. I want to know if I'm going to be serving this to my kids that there are not issues later about what we have done with this mod genetically modified fish that would cause us concern or worry. And if I'm not comfortable with that, I want to know that this fish that I might be serving or I might be buying is genetically engineered. And so I've been pushing very aggressively to say no to the FDA. You shouldn't be approving this in the first place. This would be the first genetically engineered um, species designed for human consumption that the FDA would have approved. This is not genetically modified soybeans. This is a fish that we're talking about. So I've told the FDA no, but if we cannot stop the FDA, we insist at a bare minimum that they would be required to label this as genetically engineered so that families, when they're purchasing at a store, know what is real and what is not. So if we can't keep this off the shelves, which again, we haven't given up on, at a bare minimum, we're going to make sure that consumers have that right to know. Coming out of Juneau, you know the importance of a good, strong fishery. We want to work to keep it that way. We don't want these fake fish intermingling with, with our wild, beautiful, sustainable, sustainably managed fisheries. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Max. We're going up top to Stephen here. Uh, hi, Senator Murkowski. Uh, I'm Stephen Murphy, and I graduated from Colony High School in Palmer, Alaska. And my question was, um, what current um, international issue has the biggest likelihood of affecting Alaska in a negative manner? Well, Stephen, it, it's an interesting question. It's an important question. It's very timely, and it, it ties very closely to what uh, Taylor mentioned with his concern about the, uh, uh, the reduction in, in Army forces uh, where we stand to potentially lose some 2,600 uh, men and women from, from J-Bear um, at a time when I think there is great concern about what we are seeing in terms of threats from Russia. Every, think about it, every map that you will see of Alaska shows a little piece of Russia, right? We know we are close to Russia. We know that Big Diomede and Little Diomede are two and a half miles apart. This is no joke for us in Alaska. The, 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 the heads of, of command, as I mentioned, whether it is uh, the, um, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, other military uh, uh, commanders, have testified, stood in, sat in front of us in committees, and have said that the greatest threat right now, geopolitically, is coming out of Russia. Russia, right across the Bering Straits from where we are. So this is, this is a concern for us from the sense of knowing what's going on with our neighbor to, to the west there, just across the water. We have great interests in the Arctic right now. 
and we're trying to encourage a level of cooperation amongst the Arctic nations, which of course includes Russia. But what are we seeing in Russia? What are we seeing in, in terms of, of levels of buildup uh, along the, the coast? Is it search and rescue operations to prepare for a, an emerging maritime role through the, uh, through the northern sea route? Or is this another type of, of, of buildup that we're seeing? It was just over the 4th of July that our, uh, our jets were scrambled uh, to, to intercept the, uh, some, some of the Russian aircraft that were encroaching into our, our area of airspace up there. So there is, there is an aggressive posture, I think, that we're seeing out of Russia. And as, as the, the part of the United States that is most proximate, I'm paying attention to it paying attention to it a great deal, and I think we're seeing our, our military leaders also paying very close attention to Russia. Thanks for the question. <coughs> Hello, Hi, Senator. There. My name is Kelly Chong. I recently graduated from West Valley High School from Fairbanks, Alaska, and I have a more casual question that I'd like to ask. Um, if the tradition of Senate bean soup were replaced for a day by a recipe that would represent Alaska, what would it be? These are fun ones. <laughs> so for our, to our, our, our viewers who might not know, um, in the Senate dining room, there is a traditional soup, and it's Senate bean soup. It's a white bean. Uh, I guess the recipe has been around for over 100 years. And um, it's kind of tradition when you go to the Senate dining room to have Senate bean soup. So if it was to be a recipe that would highlight Alaska, I'm going to take it back to Max's question. And I'm going to say it would have to be featuring our wild Alaska salmon. And uh, that, I think, would be a, a good marker for, for Alaska. Uh, we. We have such exceptional fisheries, and we're very proud of our fishing families, the, the men and women that uh, provide for a great resource and, and, and good jobs throughout the state, while also uh, harvesting in a, in a manner that is responsible and sustainable. So I think if I could have some kind of an Alaskan tradition on, on a Senate menu, it would feature Alaska's finest seafood. I bet we'd get a lot of people to the Senate dining room for it, too. Thank you. You bet. Alex, up to you. Yep. Hello, Senator. My name is Alex Wong, and I recently graduated from South Anchorage High School in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, my question today is, as chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, how do you influence oil and LNG production in Alaska? Well. As, as you know, because you've been shadowing me today, we've got the energy bill on the floor. Uh, you know much of, of what we have put together in this massive energy reform package are, are proposals that help us as an energy producing state. Um, we will uh, soon move forward a bill that has provisions that will allow for a more expedited process for uh, permitting for our LNG. As we know, as we try to move Alaska's natural gas from the North Slope, massive project, uh, but there are approvals that have to go through the federal uh, regulatory agencies. And so we inserted language in this bill that would allow for a time certain, which I think is helpful. We will also see a measure uh, coming up uh, this week as well that will address uh, not only oil exports and our ability as a nation to, to sell our oil uh, around the world, which will help Alaska because it, it, it allows for then greater opportunities for us to move our oil to, to more domestic refineries, allows for just greater, uh, greater opportunities overall. Included in that bill is a revenue sharing measure. 
when we access our oil resources offshore. Currently, if, if those resources are further than six miles out, the state sees no share of that. It all goes to the federal treasury. The state sees no share. That's not right. We are the host state. We bear the impact of, of development, uh, whether it is impact to our airports, the Dalton Highway, uh, medical facilities, schools. The impact is there. There is revenue sharing that is provided in the Gulf states to, uh, out of the Gulf of Mexico. We only feel it's appropriate and right that we would allow for revenue sharing uh, to Alaska as it sees development on its outer continental shelf. So I'm hopeful that we will be able to move these Alaskan priorities through the process as well. I think you all have seen, because you've all had a chance to spend a little bit of time in the Energy Committee, this is a, this is a key place for us as Alaskans to help develop those priorities that allow for jobs and economic opportunities for a resource-rich state like Alaska. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Gwen. Hello, Senator. Uh, my name is Gwen Raniger, and I graduated from KHI in Ketchikan, Alaska. Uh, my question for you is what steps must be taken to mend the deeply partisan rift in Congress? Well, with any, with any issue where you have different views and different perspectives, the only way to, to bridge those views is through discussion, through constructive um, dialogue, and, and it always helps when you're able to build relationships with one another. I think you all have seen, as you have been uh, part of this process in this last month, a, a level of dialogue and discourse that you found surprising in that we were not fighting and bickering with one another all the time. We were actually working to get some things done. I mentioned the energy bill. My, my ranking member, Senator Cantwell, a Democrat from the state of Washington, she and I have been working together for months on a bipartisan bill. Not easy because we both come at these issues with different perspectives because of the, the part of the country that we represent and just different views on some issues. But we have been building legislation rather than trying to tear down uh, ideas. And I think so much of it comes when you make a commitment to try to build rather than to just throw, throw proverbial bombs, if you will. And, and I think you can see good results of that in, in what has happened this year. We passed uh, an education bill out of the Education Committee unanimously, and then it moved through the Senate floor with a good, strong vote. That was a marker that was led by two members, a Republican and Democrat, saying it's important that we change education policy. And in that vein, Senator Cantwell and I have said it's important to change energy policy, to move it forward, to modernize it. So partisan issues will always be in place in a body like the, the Congress. That is just the nature of it. But you can be partisan without being ugly and without being um, disrespectful to another's views. And I think that's what we're trying to accomplish here. We need to govern, and we need to govern in a way that is respectful to differing views. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, you're last up. <laughs> Hello, Senator. Um, my name is Christian Escalante. I graduated from Unalaska City High School, and my question for you is if you could travel back to meet your post-high school self, what advice would you give her? Well, if I were able to go back and give advice, I would tell me to, to be more aggressive in how I, uh, 
how I asked questions. I was very quiet in high school. I did a lot of listening, and I was one of the kids in class who was, I didn't volunteer, raise my hand, and when I went to college, I, that, that continued, and I'm a pretty inquisitive person. I ask a lot of questions. Maybe it's because I had so many that were pent up when I was younger that now I'm of an age where there is no question that is, is too crazy not to ask, but I, I truly believe that, and I tell young people, don't be afraid to ask the question. Don't assume that everybody else already knows it because you'd be amazed to find out that you really don't. And even if, even if you do, then put it out there on the table. Don't be afraid to ask questions, to, to continually be educating yourself and, and, and take a little risk in that regard. The, the piece of advice that I share with young and old is don't be afraid to take a little risk. And you don't want to do stupid things. You don't want to do crazy wild risk that's going to end up hurting yourself or, or putting somebody else in, 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 in jeopardy. But push yourself to do just a little bit more. Push yourself to ask the question so that you can expand your mind. Push yourself to the point where you feel like you have learned, and in learning, you have been able to contribute to someone else's learning. So that's the advice that I would give myself, and hopefully I would listen to it. <laughs> well, we've reached the end of, of the group here. I will note that we are missing one of our interns today, Cassandra Adams, who's from Ketchikan. Uh, who wasn't able to be part of the program, but she's been a great addition to uh, our intern team this summer. And uh, I know she wanted to, she was going to ask a question about um, what, what has happened in my life that most prepared me to be a senator. And it, there's just so many things, there's so many things that go into where. Uh, where I am right now and what it is that I need to do my job. I think you truly have to love people. I think you have to be absolutely passionate about your state and, and its people and want to get up every day to make a difference, to help. And I think if there was probably one thing to point to about what has, what has helped me most in, in my uh, position representing Alaska, it's that I have been blessed to live in a whole handful of different communities. I was, I was born down in, in Ketchikan, Gwen, where you and, and Cassandra were. Um, I went to high school in Fairbanks, where Kelly went to high school. My sons, um, uh, and my husband and I raised our sons in Anchorage, where several of you are, are from. Uh, I spent time living in Juneau as a young girl, where you were, Max, and lived in Wrangell. My sister lived out in, in Dutch Harbor in Unalaska. Um, so I've had the benefit of falling in love with so many places in Alaska that when it comes time to, to, to represent the people that live in these areas. I have a very strong connection and passion for where I am. So, With that, we are well out of time. We could probably talk a lot longer about issues that you care about. And as usual, I've, I've talked too long, so we've got to wrap it up. But I think, uh, again, I, I don't want to end without thanking each of you for what you have given me, my staff, and Alaskans in this past month. Hopefully, those of you that have been watching not only this program with July's interns, but uh, were able to, to, to get to know a little bit about our interns from the first session, have gained the same sense of, of optimism about these great young people that are coming uh, out of, of the state of Alaska. Uh, coming to, to do good things for a short time and then going off 
to pursue their futures, whether it's college or other exciting opportunities. So to all of you, I wish you the best of luck as you move on. Keep in touch with us. And to those of you who have joined us, thank you for being with us on this episode of the Alaska Report. We'll see you next time.